idea of humans having a negative impact on the environment. I hated the idea of us going into natural environments and screwing them up. It just made me mad. But my thought was that, you know, if we could just separate people from natural environments, if we could just get people out of there, that would be the best way to preserve natural environments. You know, if you want to keep a place uh, preserved in a more natural state, just separate humans from that uh, environment there, and that's that would be the best way to preserve them, get, get, get people out of the system. That was my idea. Well, in college, I was a biology major, and one of the early uh, classes I took, we read a, a paper, a paper that was looking at the components of snow in a really pretty pristine natural area. So this is uh, an area that was up in Glacier National Park. Has anyone been to Glacier? up in northwest Montana and in the winter it's just miles and miles away from the nearest person that's what they were doing was looking at snow way up in the mountains miles and miles away from the nearest per person to see what was in that snow well obviously the water and the snow but they would also find that in some layers there was just super high concentrations of nitrogen in that layer like like fertilizer in other layers there was high concentrations of DDT in the snow. <laughs> you know what DDT is? What is it? Yeah, it's a pesticide. It's a pesticide that basically it hasn't been used in the US since 1972. It was banned in the US, well, because it was one of the reasons why bald eagle were going extinct, and peregrine falcons, and osprey, and some of the other uh, raptors. It's a nasty, nasty chemical. This study was done in the 90s, and they were finding DDT in the snow miles away from people. What the researchers realized was that there were uh, dust storms in Asia. Dust storms that would blow dust way, way up in the atmosphere that uh, dust would then float across uh, the Pacific and be sort of the nucleation sites for snow formation. Snow would then fall down in North America, <laughs> including in pristine natural areas like Glacier National Park, carrying that pollution from thousands of miles away. Well, what this made me realize was that <laughs> you know, my idea of just separating humans from natural environments, it's not going to work. It can't work. We're a part of the system. We are a part of the system. We are a part of all ecosystems on this planet. We are a part of the biosphere. Whether we like it or not, we're a part of the system. And there's nothing we can do to separate ourselves from those systems the way it is now. We are, uh, our, our impact is pervasive across the globe. And so, you know, my idea of trying to separate people uh, from ecosystems, it, it can't be done. That's not the choice anymore. The question isn't whether we should be part of the system or not. It's, it's really what part of the system should we be? You know, we can choose to be a good part of systems. Or we can choose to be a bad part of systems. We can choose to be good players, players that uh, uh, promote the health, the stability, the integrity of natural ecosystems, or we can choose to be bad players within the systems and do the opposite of that. That is the question more and more, and it's actually a question that more and more of science is realizing. 
And so new scientific disciplines have actually been built on that question. One uh, new discipline is called green chemistry. Uh, it's actually just a couple decades old. And uh, green chemistry is basically the idea of doing chemistry in a way that's sustainable, doing chemistry in a way that uses less toxic reagents and reactions and produces less toxic uh, waste and less waste at the end of reactions. And it's not just you know, within high school chemistry, college chemistry classes, it's within manufacturing uh, chemistry. Chemistry that's done in industry, doing the same thing. How can we do our uh, industrial reactions in a way that would produce less toxic and less waste products, perhaps produce products that then can be used, reused within that system. Um, anyway, so this is a, a brand new uh, uh, discipline within science that uh, takes this idea of humans being a part of systems into, into account. Uh, Marion University actually has one of the only uh, green chemistry programs in the nation. Um, another new discipline in science, just a few decades old, is ecological restoration, restoration ecology. And it's, it's also built on this idea that we are a part of the system, and we can actually be a good part of the system. We can actually restore natural landscapes. We can take degraded landscapes, places like a lawn or a, uh, an agricultural field or an urban environment, and take those natural landscapes and move them more toward, excuse me, uh, those degraded landscapes and move them more toward natural landscapes. Move them more toward, well, maybe what they were historically before they became degraded landscapes. What were they then? Can we re uh, restore them to what they used to be. And restoration ecology is the science of trying to understand how that can be done in a scientific way. And it's actually a, just a brand new, uh, brand new field in, in biology. Well, what I thought we'd do to start out with is I wanted to uh, just give you a, uh, a few potential examples of restoration ecology and have you give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down whether you think this is actually restoration ecology or not. All right. Here's the first one. We've got uh, a lawn here, and the fellow is uh, out trying to kill off the dandelions in their lawn. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Is this restoration ecology, yes or no? A lot of thumbs down here. All right, there was an emphatic thumbs down in the back. Why do you say? Yeah. Okay, yeah, he's taking away some of the diversity, right? He's killing something off, and that might make you think that, yeah, it's not restoration ecology. There's a couple things I didn't tell you, though, um, and uh, this might change your, change your answer a little bit to know this. First of all, uh, dandelions, are these native plant species or not native? They're actually not native. They're actually not native to North America. They've been here a long time but they were brought over maybe 200, 250 years ago as, as food. Actually, they're a popper. They're brought here as food, and uh, they're, they're pretty invasive. They're, so they're a non-native, pretty invasive plant. And one thing that restoration ecologists often do will be to remove non-native invasive plants from a natural system. <laughs> and that's the second thing I didn't tell you that uh, maybe you didn't know is that uh, the lawn here is it's not a natural system. Yeah, it's nature, it's, it's alive, right? But if you would have come to Indiana 200 years ago, would you have found any lawns here? No. No, there weren't any lawns here. There was prairie. There was prairie in Indiana. Has anyone been to a prairie in Indiana? What's it, what's it like? Do you know? No, it's, it, they're big. They're, they're like seven to ten feet tall. The grasses are in in our prairies in Indiana, real prairies. It's not this stuff. This is something different. This is something that we've brought in and sort of imposed upon the landscape. So this isn't the natural environment. So here, it's it's not restoration ecology because you're going from a degraded landscape, a lawn with dandelions, <laughs> to a degraded landscape, a lawn. You're not restoring a natural. <clears throat> Let's do a different example here. This is uh, a beautiful T-shirt that can be yours. It's a uh, it's a picture of uh, Banff National Park. Have you been to Banff? Anyone been to Banff? 
Yeah, what do you remember from band? Um, what was the what, what are some pretty things that you remember? Like Lake Louise, yeah, Lake Louise. Mountains, and then really like really, really Yeah, right. And that's what people think of when they think of Banff, where they're just the spectacular turquoise colored lakes, uh, the glaciers, the the mountains that are just really jagged and they're just right next to you. None of that is in this t-shirt. Um, but what they, what they do have is a, a natural meadow here, a native meadow, that's just full of dandelions. I don't know why anybody would want this, but dandelions are invasive to natural meadows as well. If we go in there and remove the dandelions, is this restoration ecology? Thumbs up, thumbs down. What do you think? Don't be shy. Thumbs up, why? I mean, because you're restoring like the ecosystem like it's natural stage. Right, yeah, you're removing this invasive plant. The problem with invasive plants is that they tend to uh, usurp habitat, take away habitat from the native plants. So that's something that restoration ecologists often do is remove invasive plants. Uh, and that hopefully will help the uh, uh, native plants in this, this natural meadow here. Okay. That would be restoration ecology. How about this example? 1995, wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone National Park. Is the reintroduction of wolves? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs up? Why do you say? Because <laughs> they were really native that uh, they're being reintroduced to. Yeah. Right. They were native to the, that system. They were there 100 years ago. And you're just reintroducing them. To that system, right? <laughs> Do you know who got rid of the wolves in Yellowstone National Park? It was the park rangers. It was the National Park Service. The National Park Service actually got rid of the wolves. You know why? Because they're bad animals. Because <laughs> wolves are bad animals. Wolves. Uh, mountain lions, uh, grizzly bears, they're bad animals. We need to get rid of the bad animals so we can have more good animals. You know what the good animals are? Bunnies, deer, elk, moose. Those are the good animals. That's why people want to go to national parks. It's to see the good animals. Right? Not the bad ones. Not the big bad wolf here. These are scary. This was policy. Can you believe this? This is weird, isn't it? This was policy back in the 20s and 30s. They were actively trying to get rid of the top predators. Now, of course, they realize that that was a stupid idea. And they are actually pretty embarrassed, the Park Service is, that they did this. And they went to really pretty great expense to try and bring back uh, wolves uh, and great political expense as well. It's still a major political deal in the area, uh, the reintroduction of wolves and wolves being around. Um, they, uh, uh, the wolves is, you know, they're, they're a keystone species. Have you heard this term, keystone species? This is, it's a species that if you remove it, it's like taking out the keystone in like an arch, right? The thing falls apart. It, there's, a, there's a big effect of the removal of this, this species. It affects the what, population of elk and moose and deer. That then affects populations of the vegetation that those things feed on, which then affects the populations of other things that feed on that vegetation. So they have a really big impact. So the reintroduction of wolves to the system, uh, yeah, that would be uh, restoration problem. All right, how about this example? Uh, two dams on the Elwha River in Washington State are slated for removal in 2012. Is dam removal restoration ecology? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs up? Why do you say? Because But you're not adding any plants or animals. Right, right, yeah. So, I mean, you've got to get that, that abiotic environment right first, before you mess with the biotic environment. Before you try and do any restoration with the plants or animals, you have to get that non-living environment right. So, you know, the point of this is to try and get salmon back in this river. And so you could just go in there and chuck salmon out into that lake. Well, they're not going to be able to swim downstream to get back out into the ocean to, to grow big. They're not going to be able to swim way upstream to spawn up in the upper reaches. So there's no point. 
and doing that restoration until you have that abiotic environment right, until you have the flow of the river back. That's, that's the idea here is we'll get the flow of the river back, that will uh, then entice the, uh, the salmon to basically reintroduce themselves uh, to this river. And that'll be good for the salmon. It'll also be good for orca. Uh, salmon are an endangered species. Orca are endangered as well. You know what orca are? Yeah, killer whale. Killer whale. Killer whale, killer whale feed on salmon. And since salmon populations have declined, orca populations have declined as well. So they're hoping that this will uh, be helpful. This is thought of as the, uh, the largest restoration project in the world right now is removing this dam. All right, another example, or potential example anyway. Here's a, a dry farm field, and the plan here, this is Indiana, dry farm field in Indiana. We're going to install native Indiana wetland plants here in this dry farm field. It's that restoration ecology, thumbs up, thumbs down. Oh, a thumbs down over here? Why is that? Okay, yeah, it depends on what was there before, right? So restoration ecologists deal with history. History is important in restoration ecology. And so trying to understand what was there before, I mean, looking at it right now, it looks like it's probably just a dumb idea to put wetland plants there. They're going to die, right? But you can actually do some history here. We can actually take a soil sample, and wetland soils are have a pretty characteristic uh, uh, look to them. So you could look at that soil and say, oh yeah, that's a wetland soil right here. It's dry right now, something's going on. You know, either it's wet at some time of the year and we just you know, aren't at that time of the year right now, or maybe <coughs> maybe it was a wetland, you know, 100 years ago before the farmer got there. And, uh, you know, often farmers would find uh, wetlands. Wetlands have really nice fertile soil, and so they uh, basically drain those wetlands, put in this, these big uh, pipes, basically drainage tile, to carry the water off of the, the wetland here, and then they could farm that, uh, that land. So if we find that there's wetland soil here, we look around for drainage tile uh, along the ditches nearby, we could break up that drainage tile, and then, you know, after you restore the abiotic system here, restore the hydrology, restore the water regime in this area, then you could restore the wetland plants to the area. So it could be wetland restoration if this was a wetland at some point. History matters. This, on the other hand, I mean, it, it looks like the hydrology is right uh, just by sort of giving a surface view of it. And uh, so this probably would be a fine place to do wetland restoration. All right, one last uh, uh, potential example here. <clears throat> this is the estate of a billionaire. At least in today's dollars, he was a billionaire. Here's his, uh, uh, this is his $120 million <laughs> mansion. Right here, can you imagine, $120 million mansion? Well, he uh, uh, hired a, a landscape architect to uh, design and install his, his landscape here. Is that ecological restoration? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Or, you don't know, you need to know something else. What else do you need to know? Yeah. Plant plants. Yeah, what he planted. Right? You need to know what he planted. Because you can actually landscape in a way that's restoration ecology. Right? And let me tell you what he did. He. Uh, um, in the wet areas, which there are a lot, there are a lot of springs on this property, in the wet areas he planted native Indiana wetland plants. And in the dry areas, up in the bluff here, the upland, he planted native Indiana bluff or upland species. Down in the floodplain along the creek here, this is Crooked Creek by the way, he planted native floodplain species. Is this ecological restoration? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, it's a thumbs up, right? You can landscape in a way that is ecological restoration if you use native plants where they should go in ecologically sensible locations. This, this is part of the campus of Mary University. And it was the, uh, was the estate of uh, James Allison, Allison, well, you know Allison from uh, Allison Transmission, Allison Engine, you've heard of the Indy 500, obviously. He was one of the founders of the Indy 500. Uh, Allison 
uh, was trying to get out of the city, out into the country for his uh, estate, and he found this uh, farmland way out in the country where uh, he decided to build his estate. Have you been to Marion University? Have you been there? Is, is it way out in the country? No. This is what it looked like back in 1910. It was. It was farmland out there, on, not, not even 100 years ago. Um, he hired this guy to design his landscape. This is Jens Jensen. I love this picture of Jensen. He, uh, to me, it looks a bit like a, a bit of a dreamer. He had big ideas. And he did. He was trying to change the world, Jensen was. He was trying to change the world using, well, restoration ecology, what we now call restoration ecology. He was a landscape architect, but he did landscaping in a way that now is almost indistinguishable from restoration ecology. He was, uh, he was very into the prairie landscape, uh, the landscape right around Chicago. That's where he was based back in the mid to late 1800s. He liked the, to go out into the prairie around Chicago and was really a, just sort of a student of the landscape. And he uh, got a job uh, designing some of the big parks in Chicago and uh, designed them in a way that, well, it's basically restoration ecology. He was using native plants in those designs and planting them basically where they should go. And uh, uh, was doing this, well, for the sake of the land, for one thing, but more so for the sake of people. He was doing this restoration work uh, for people because he believed that uh, people need access natural environments, that there's something about us that needs access to, to nature. There's something about us mentally or physically or spiritually uh, or, uh, or physically that, that has a need for access to nature. And, you know, you've got to remember where he was. He was in Chicago, mid to late 1800s. Chicago was a disaster at the time. Have you read uh, <coughs> The Jungle, Upton Sinclair? Yeah, is, does that seem like a place you'd want to live? No, it just sounded awful. It was the, the, the jungle is written about uh, the meatpacking industry in Chicago in the mid 1800s, and it was oh man, it's just a nasty place to be. There was a huge influx of people, and the infrastructure just wasn't there for those people. The social services weren't there, the protections weren't there. It was just really an awful place to be. And so he was thinking about uh, these parks as uh, ways for people get away from sort of the dehumanizing effects of the city and that, that the nature then, natural areas, could be sort of an antidote to the ills of the city. Here's what he says. He says, we have no right to consider ourselves civilized as long as we permit less fortunate residents of our city to live and multiply in unhealthy surroundings. This is the city he's talking about here. Unhealthy surroundings that are devoid of beauty and that are a peril to the whole population and a menace normal development of our civilization. <laughs> the cities are the downfall of our civilization. They're a peril to our population. This is an interesting idea. And it's actually an idea that's just been recycled here recently. Um, there's a book out uh, real recently called Last Child in the Woods. Has anyone heard of this book? It's actually a pretty popular book. It's a bestseller, pretty popular in education circles. And uh, the author is arguing that uh, there's more and more scientific evidence to support basically what Jensen uh, was suggesting, that people need interaction with natural environments, that there's something about us that needs to be um, in natural environments uh, during some portion of our development. And that a lot of the ills uh, that, well, <laughs> my generation to your generation and my kids' generation a lot of the ills that uh, uh, we face, things like uh, autism or ADD or ADHD, those types of things, are attributable to, suggesting there's more scientific evidence that they're attributable to a lack of interaction with natural areas. Now, we need interaction with natural areas. <laughs> I distinctly remember uh, at least three Christmases that I begged my parents for an Atari 2600. You guys all have a car It's a sweet machine. I got uh, Space Invaders, and uh, I remember uh, waiting outside the store until it opened up the day that Pac-Man came out. Whew, that was a disappointment. 
kids. <laughs> it was not that much fun. But uh, I spent way too much time inside playing uh, Atari, and I suppose that you all spent a lot of time uh, inside uh, doing things similar to that. I know my kids spend too much time on the Wii and on webkins and other crazy things like that. And also, uh, beginning with my generation, our parents became paranoid completely paranoid of, of wild areas, of natural areas. It's just, they're scary. There might be homeless people, there might be crazies out there. Who knows what could happen in a wild area like that. Keep your kids on the playground. You've got the nice rubberized surface underneath so you can't get hurt. If you do get hurt, you know who to sue. It's, you know, it's a, that's the safe place to have your uh, kids play. <laughs> and so less and less, my generation to yours and beyond are spending less time outside. Right, and the thought is that uh, that has had an effect on us, who we are, and our development. It's an interesting idea, anyway. What do you think? Crazy? Oh, interesting, anyway. Think about it. Well, uh, Jensen designed this landscape uh, back in 1912 and uh, did it in a way that's very, very similar to what a restoration ecologist would do today. He used native plants where they should go and he used really huge numbers. It's very different than uh, what a landscape architect might do today. Here's a, just a blow up here of a, a landscape, of a landscape plan. It's maybe 20 feet wide here by 80 feet or so long, maybe double, uh, triple the size of this room. He's got uh, 600 red oak, 600 hard maple, 1,200 trees that he's planting. If this were your yard, double the size of this room, would you plant 1,200 trees? <laughs> you know, a typical landscape architecture would have specimen trees here and there, right? This is not, this is, this is very atypical. This is what a restoration ecologist does. When I'm doing forest restoration, I'm planting thousands of trees. They're, they're this big, they're a year, maybe two years old, but we're planting thousands of trees and basically letting them fight it out, you know, letting competition take place. That's, that's the way restoration ecology is, is done. He was doing it that way, and this is, what, 80 years before restoration ecology really was, was even born. So, uh, just a reminder, 100 years ago it was a farm field, and Jensen did what uh, we're now uh, considering basically ecological restoration on that site, we can use this site then as a case study to understand whether restoration ecology actually works or not. You can look at it and say, all right, so what's, you know, what's going on? What's, what's left? What's there now? This, uh, this is actually one of the oldest restoration sites in the world. So it makes a great case study for understanding whether restoration ecology is, is good or bad. Well, here's the first thing we did. We uh, uh, went out with the old planting plan and looked at the planting plan to see what he planted where. And we were looking for trees that match the right species in the right place and the right age, you know, 90 to 100 years old or so. And so all these dots on the plan here are uh, these uh, trees that might have been planted by Jensen, that probably were planted by Jensen. Well, if you actually look at the plan, he planted well over 10,000 trees. <laughs> look at how many are left. About 40 or 50 or so? How do you do? He was a failure, right? He was a complete failure. There's nothing left. What do you say? You agree? You're shaking your head. Why? <laughs> does it? Does it? I mean, does it matter? Does it matter that the tree I plant is there in a hundred years? Is that what you're going for? If you're a restoration ecologist, do you really care that your tree is there in a hundred years? What do you care about? Yeah. What is there in a hundred years? Is it a high quality, functioning natural landscape? That's what you care about. It doesn't matter whether your tree is there. So that, that's sort of the next thing we looked at then was that, yeah, there, there aren't many of Jensen's actual trees there, but what is there? And to do that, we did what's called a floristic quality assessment. And a floristic quality assessment uh, basically is a way of, it's something that actually restoration ecologists do quite a bit, trying to understand 
how well they did with their restoration. And it combines species richness here, uh, the number of species that are on the site, it combines species richness with the, how conservative each of these species are. Is it a species that will you know, grow in your backyard if you stop mowing the lawn? Is it just a weed? Or is it one that uh, is actually the only one that you find in really pretty pristine natural areas? And so um, really there's a difference here. You might, you might uh, do a restoration project and find that uh, most of your, uh, you've got a good diversity, but they're all weeds. It's not saying much for how well you did, right? If you do one and you find that a lot of them are species that you find mostly in, in uh, a pretty uh, pristine environment, pretty natural environments, and that's, that's saying something, you did a pretty good job. So um, a restoration uh, project, you check it 10 years later, do an FQI here, and you get maybe a 25 to 35, that's good. You've done a good job, that's pretty good. Uh, you go to a, a natural area, uh, like uh, one of our state parks, a pretty nice natural area, and do a uh, fluorescent quality index, you'd get maybe 45 to a 55. <laughs> Look at this. Got a 70 for a site that's almost downtown, <laughs> for a site that's uh, well, 100 years ago was a farm field. This is an astronomically high. This is a crazy high number. This, to me, gives me hope. Gives me hope that uh, something that Jensen did, restoration ecology, might actually work. Or, or maybe it's just the 100 years here. One way or the other, you can go from a farm field to a really high quality natural area in less than 100 years. This is cool. This, this gives me hope that we can actually have a positive impact on, on our landscapes. Well, uh, Jensen, or excuse me, Allison died in the 20s. Uh, the Sisters of St. Francis at Oldenburg purchased the property uh, for Marion College uh, back in the 30s. They moved up from near Cincinnati up to Indianapolis uh, back in the 30s. And uh, also in, oh excuse me, then in, uh, in the 40s and 50s, lots of uh, the halls were built there on campus. This is the old Allison Mansion right here. And so that estate that we've been talking about is this area right in here. This is the, the part that we uh, uh, called the Eco Lab. The big halls on campus a little bit south of that old uh, estate. So this this ecological laboratory is, is basically our outdoor uh, uh, learning laboratory, research laboratory. Uh, we use it for outreach as well. We'll talk more about that in a second. But also in the meantime, probably 40, 50 years ago, a lot of invasive plants showed up on the site. This is one called honeysuckle. Uh, that had totally taken over by the late 90s. Uh, all these arching branches here are honeysuckle. All the green that you see in the picture is honeysuckle as well. It's a nasty, nasty invasive. It's a really bad uh, plant. Um, and it's sort of the scourge of uh, woodlands in the Midwest. What happens is that uh, you've got sort of the overstory uh, uh, tree species but then down below, you've got this layer of honeysuckle 10 to 20 feet tall, and nothing else grows. You know, it's just bare dirt under the honeysuckle and young honeysuckle coming up. There are no, you know, there's no forest regeneration. There are no new trees coming up. There's no shrubs. There's no ground vegetation at all. It's just honeysuckle. Honeysuckle comes in and basically outcompetes everything. It gains their leaves uh, before everything else. They lose their leaves after everything else. And uh, they also have some chemical warfare going on. They, uh, they're allelopathic, have you heard this word, allelopathy? Allelopathy is uh, where um, a, a, a plant produces chemicals that cause other plants not to be able to grow. So they inhibit germination, they inhibit uh, growth of other species. And so uh, they're actually using these chemicals then in the leaves to uh, cause other species not to be able to grow, and they, they outcompete other species really well. It's, uh, it's a nasty, uh, uh, pretty bad invasive. This is an Asian uh, species here. Ah, but look, it's cute. It's really cute. It's got these cute little red berries, pretty white flowers. It smells nice. Yeah. Wait, how did it get to, like, if it's in Asia, how did it get here? Yeah, how did it get to the US? It was brought here um, as a uh, ornamental, most likely to begin with a pretty plant. A lot of a lot of the non-native plants were brought here early on, especially as ornamental plants, just 
pretty plants. And uh, uh, this one was actually uh, prescribed for uh, a wildlife, as a wildlife plant. Fish and Wildlife thought this would be a good idea to plant this stuff at one point. Now they realize that wasn't a good idea, it's a really bad idea. The birds like it, the birds like it a lot. And that's part of the problem, is that they spread it around really, really quickly, and it just totally takes over. And that's, that's really the issue. So plants, uh, invasive plants were brought here as uh, ornamental plants. They're brought here as food, like dandelions were brought here as food. You know uh, Queen Anne's lace? Have you heard of that one? They've got sort of pretty big white flowers. They're a non-native plant. It was, it was brought here as a carrot. It's got a, a tuber at the bottom that's, that's basically a carrot. Docus carota is the scientific name. So uh, that was another reason plants were brought. And other plants have just gotten here, right? Just hitched a ride on uh, uh, with whatever people or, or uh, uh, with other uh, things that were being brought. Anyway, so uh, do, you, do you have this in your yard? <laughs> yeah, you should kill it. <laughs> you have my permission to sneak out and kill it in the middle of the night. It's evil, evil stuff. <laughs> As are tomatoes. Tomatoes are evil as well. Daffodils, tomatoes, they're not native. Well, all right, so they're not native. They're not indigenous. They weren't from here. They weren't here 250 years ago. They, you know, tomatoes are from South America. Uh, daffodils, I think, are European. Uh, but, you know, they're not a problem, right? They're, they're not an evil plant like the honeysuckle is. They're not taken over. You know, we're not, you don't go out to your little, uh, you know, the cross-country course out here and see tomatoes growing everywhere. No, they're not taking over. So, you know, restoration ecologists are worried about the invasive plants that are non-native, but not about the, the other uh, non-native plants. That's not, it's not that big of a deal, all right? And so, uh, you're really just thinking about the invasive plants. And that's a pretty small portion of all the non-native plants that are out there. Like uh, this one, this is Oriental Bittersweet, it's another Asian species that's a vine that grows up and over shrubs and trees and kills them off. It's another very invasive plant here in Indiana. Well, so in the 90s, uh, late 90s, um, uh, the place, the, the Eco Lab, this uh, old Jensen landscape, was totally overrun with some of these uh, invasive plants. We came in in about 2000, 2001, and started killing off. Uh, those invasive plants. We would chop them down. This is a brush cutter this fellow is using. It's basically a saw blade um, on the end of a sort of a souped up weed eater. And you chop them down and then treat the stump. Treat the stump with an herbicide. This is uh, glyphosate, it's basically round up. But you gotta treat the stump or else it'll grow six feet in a year. These things grow back instantly if you don't treat them. So uh, we tried. Uh, we were started removing these invasive plants uh, in the early 2000s. We also did some pretty major restoration projects on the site uh, at that time. We were uh, doing restoration on areas like this where uh, dirt had been dumped back in a wetland back in the 40s and 50s. So we removed that dirt from the wetland to get the hydrology right again. That way we could uh, restore the wetland plants to that wetland. We also sort of rediscovered all sorts of really cool artifacts out there. Things from that old uh, Allison estate, uh, put in a couple miles of trail. We've got two miles of trail on this property. It's really fun. This is an old cistern. It's a, uh, basically it's sitting on top of a spring and collecting water. It was collecting water for the mansion back in the day. That's where uh, Allison got his uh, water. We've done lots of restoration projects with lots of uh, young kids. We're trying to get kids involved in uh, restoration from preschool up to high school and beyond. We're trying to get people actually to get their hands on with doing some of this restoration work. Uh, they're planting uh, some prairie plants here. It's one of my students on the left. It's Mallory. Planted thousands of trees. That's within the, what's in these blue tubes here. Planted tens of thousands of other plants as well. Let me show you some before and after shots here. Uh, the before shots are <laughs> they're mostly just a wall of honeysuckle. That's what this green is here. It's just honeysuckle. And you, you know, if there was a trail in the area before the honeysuckle was removed, you wouldn't be able to see anything off of it because it was just a wall of honeysuckle on both sides of that trail. But when you remove honeysuckle, this is what happens. 
Uh, in the middle here, this is this is a trail here, and that's that's what it will, what it looked like before you removed honeysuckles, just bare dirt underneath a layer of honeysuckle. But now, all around where the trail is, you've got a nice diversity of native Indiana uh, plants uh, growing on the ground, also uh, also shrubs in here, and some. Uh, at least under six years old trees growing up. So this is what it looks like about six years after honeysuckle is removed. You've got a nice diversity of native plants and a really good coverage of native plants. This is what uh, woodlands in Indiana typically look like. They look a bit more like this. So it's a really, it's a good thing to remove that honeysuckle. It does a good job. Here's another before shot. Uh, all these arching branches here, that's the honeysuckle, and the green, all the green here is the honeysuckle as well. Notice this arch though, this white arch in the background. That's this. <laughs> it's like uh, uncovering a lost civilization out there in the jungle when they're removing this honeysuckle. This, this old bridge that was lost out there. We had a, a soccer field basically right down to the edge of this pond here and uh, planted wetland plants all along the edge instead, planted grassland next to it. It acts as a bit of a buffer for water that's coming off that field and uh, cleans up that water a little bit before it hits the pond. It was just a muddy field here. Now look at that. Yeah, happy kids, happy kids on the field. They're uh, collecting seeds, some uh, grassland seeds. Uh, they're collecting <coughs> to sow in another area of the campus. Well, here's a study. I think I'm going to skip uh, over this study. This is, uh, we're trying to get some scientific evidence for that picture I showed you a little bit ago, the effects of the removal of honeysuckle. So people are spending thousands and thousands of dollars on honeysuckle removal. We spent over 100000 on honeysuckle removal on our site. And nobody had any scientific data for what happens when you remove honeysuckle. Does it work? And so that's, that's what we were doing here, was trying to uh, 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 quantify what happens when you remove honeysuckle. Basically, we found that when you remove honeysuckle, you get an uh, increase in the amount of native uh, plant coverage and native species richness, the number of native species out there. The other thing we found was that you also got some exotics, some other non-natives coming in. This is one called garlic mustard right here. It grows about hip high and grows basically as a wheat field uh, underneath trees in a forest. It's another pretty nasty invasive here. And so that comes in after you remove honeysuckles, so that's something else that you have to work on if you remove honeysuckles, getting rid of the garlic mustard. But all in all, it was a good thing uh, to remove that uh, the honeysuckle. Well, here's the study I wanted to skip ahead to. It's, uh, well, you know, we've done a lot of work with the, the plants on the site. We've done a lot of work in the last 10 years removing the uh, invasive plants and uh, planting native plants in the area, but we haven't done anything with animals. We haven't done anything as far as adding or removing animals. So our question was, what happens with the animals on the site? Are we seeing any changes there? So we looked at uh, uh, bird uh, species um, and populations, diversity, and uh, um, to, to do that, we were looking during the breeding season, basically from the start of the uh, restoration project to uh, just this last year, doing point counts. Point counts are where you go to a specific uh, set of points within your area that you're trying to census the birds in, and you stand there at that point for five minutes, some length of time. While you're doing that, you're recording all the birds that you hear. It's during the breeding season, so the males are singing, and the males are territorial, so they're staying in particular areas, and so you're you're listening, you might hear a northern cardinal over here and another one back behind you. You might hear a, a blue gray gnat catcher calling over here and a red winged blackbird one over here and another one over here. You write down all the different uh, individuals that you're hearing around you. Well, by doing that in all your 14 points, you get a pretty good estimate of the population, what's, what's on your site and then. You can compare that from year to year get a pretty good idea of trends in uh, the populations of these birds. So that's what we did, and here's, uh, here's some of the data here. Uh, this is just a, uh, a list of the most common species from the most common uh, down. You probably could have guessed 
the top one there, lots of cardinals. You probably would have thought that might be the case. Check out number four on this list, though. Baltimore Oriole, the fourth most common breeding bird in the Ecolab is the Baltimore Oriole. Did you guess that? <laughs> you ever seen one? The baseball player you mean? Yeah. No. Yeah, they're, they're beautiful. They're beautiful bird. They're bright uh, black and yellow and orange, just striking color combinations, really, really pretty. Uh, birds. They build these sort of bag nests that they weave together that hang underneath branches. They're really a cool bird. We've got tons of them out here. And this is, what, just a few miles from downtown from the circle? Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty neat. You know this bird here? It's a woodpecker. Can you guess? It's got a red head. Hey, yeah. I know your ornithology. Good, red headed woodpecker. This this is a wood duck here. Notice the can you see the little ducklings on her back? You're supposed to say aww. Let me show you some data here. Um, here we have on uh, uh, this axis we've got time uh, basically from the start of the restoration project back uh, near 2001 to just this last summer breeding season. And uh, a few uh, uh, lines here. One, the blue one, is the total number of species on the site. You notice that there's a trend toward an increase in the total number of species here. So we're getting more species on the site. Also, uh, you might dis uh, discern a bit of a trend in the number of listed species on the site. Listed species are ones that, uh, they're actually uh, species that are in decline elsewhere. So there's, there's species that are on a list of conservation concern, either, either regionally or uh, nationally uh, of conservation concern. So these are species that are declining elsewhere. Um, the green line, this is a statistically significant increase here, of the number of individuals of species that are in decline elsewhere. So we're getting more and more individuals of species that are actually having a hard time in other areas. This is pretty cool that we're providing habitat with this restoration for species that, that basically need it the most, species that are in decline in other areas. This is, this is good. There are a few species that are increasing in number here, some pretty common species like uh, the, uh, the robin, American robin, red-winged blackbirds, yellow-throated warblers in the middle there. And here's one species that's in decline. You know this one? Backyard. It's a goldfinch. All right, nod your heads. Yes, yes, it's a goldfinch, of course. It's, they're actually declining on the site. Here are a few uh, uh, species that are listed as species of conservation concern that are increasing on the site. The one on the left there is the blue gray net catcher. In the middle is uh, the great crested flycatcher. These are going to be on the exam. Uh, on the right is uh, the warbling vireo. And these are all uh, increasing on the site, and that, this this is this is good. We're we're removing the invasive plants, we're planting native plants, and the birds seem to be uh, reacting to that uh, that change. Well, we've done a lot of restoration <laughs> research on the site, and basically we're finding that yeah, what Jensen did is good. What we've been doing is good as well. We're getting an increase in the diversity and the uh, coverage of native plants. We're also affecting the birds that are there as well. But this isn't the only thing that's going on on this property. We've got uh, a lot of other fun things that are happening in, in the Ecolab. We're, we're sort of trying to be like Jensen here with the <laughs> Ecolab. We're trying to change the world with this site through ecological restoration, through getting people involved in ecological restoration, through getting people out into natural areas. Our own students, of course, but other students as well, other uh, local community members as well. Uh, we're trying to, uh, listen to the, this is the subtitle here of Last Child, was the book I was talking to you about, Saving Our Children from Nature Deficit Disorder. It's trying to save our children from nature deficit disorder by getting them out into these natural environments and doing environmental education, teaching them about 
native Indiana environments, teaching them about conservation, teaching them about how they can be a positive force in uh, their, the landscapes that they are in. So we think that the environment affects who we are. It affects us. It affects humans. Getting people involved, grade school kids uh, doing uh, restoration projects out there, all the way from preschool up to uh, high school groups come out and participate in these restoration projects. Of course, our own students participate in these projects as well. They actually help design these projects. Uh, in a lot of cases, they are, um, uh, they're actually, <laughs> they're, we have paid internships out here to do some of this restoration work, to do some of this environmental science, uh, to come up with uh, restoration plans to help with uh, the environmental education that we do. So you can get hands-on experience uh, at Marion doing some of this uh, environmental science. It's good stuff. We're also doing other uh, research projects on the campus. It's not just restoration ecology. We've got uh, research on uh, basic be beaver behavior. We've got a couple of colonies of beaver there on the site, and one of the things that we're looking at is the, well, maybe you don't know this, but beaver actually dig beaver canals. They, they dig these canals. These are roadways, basically, for the beaver, ways for a beaver to get back into their sort of buffet where they feed, and uh, it's, it's sort of a, a, a little highway system that they build. So we're doing some of, the, some of the first research on beaver canals in an area like this. We do other uh, research um, out here on, um, on the site and, and at Marion as well, Chem chemistry research, and molecular biology, and some other research projects are going on. It's a great spot for classes. I, I, I've got a class that we meet outside almost every class period. That's just where we meet, we go outside. It's uh, my ecology class. We meet, uh, we actually now have a nice outdoor laboratory, or uh, a classroom, it's this beautiful, uh, uh, shelter out there that we uh, can have classes in and uh, it's just a great place to go out we uh, collect ecological data and then analyze those data it's a great place to learn ecology here's one of those beaver lodges beautiful spot here's a beaver canal this is one of those canals that the beaver dig Well, we're trying to change the world through ecological restoration, through environmental education of our own students, but also of uh, other students as well that we bring on campus, local community. We're trying to develop more and better environmental citizens through the Ecolab. And you can join us. You can join us in this. Actually, I meant to hand out this paper here. One and pass it on. Um, you can join us. Uh, as high school students, uh, we've got lots of volunteer opportunities. If you have an interest in environmental science or uh, ecology or restoration ecology, any of that stuff, come out and get some experience doing it. Um, email me. My email's on the back of this, uh, this sheet here. Um, it's the uh, ecolab at marion.edu address that's on this. And I can hook you up with uh, some volunteer opportunities. We've got a, a full-time person that works with volunteers out there, so we can certainly uh, accommodate you. Another way to get involved as a high school uh, student is with the Ames program. It's on the back of this brochure uh, up in the uh, upper left corner. The Ames program is a program for people that are interested in science and want to do some more science over the summer. It's a great way to get uh, some more experience and. Uh, science and math over the summer. But then also, especially as you're thinking about colleges, think about Marion. Marion University is a really good uh, place to go, not just for uh, biology or environmental science. It's great. Uh, we've got a, a great uh, nursing program, bi uh, business program, uh, education program, lots of good uh, uh, liberal arts programs as well, things like uh, political science and history and uh, English and those types of programs. But then, if you are interested in environmental science, um, the, we have an environmental science concentration within the biology major. So you come out as a biology major, which gives you a really wide range of background and a wide range of job opportunities. Um, and you would also be a, a environmental, uh, a, 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 have an environmental concentration, which means that you take all the, uh, what I think are the fun classes, the environmental uh, classes, you would be an environmental scientist, 
but you'd also be a biologist as well. So this, I think, is a really good uh, program that we have for environmental science. On the second uh, page on the inside, it talks about uh, the chemistry programs that might be of interest to you if you have an interest in uh, environmental anything. We talked about green chemistry, talks about that a little bit here as well. So lots of different programs uh, for people. And really, uh, the, the outlook for jobs in environmental science is, is pretty good right now. It's one of the areas that's growing pretty rapidly as far as uh, uh, the, the new jobs that are available in environmental science. Uh, it's pretty good. Uh, lots of different uh, potential job types from working uh, for the government doing uh, wildlife biology or uh, uh, wetland ecology or uh, working with uh, uh, trying to understand water quality uh, concerns, those types of things, um, to uh, working for uh, nonprofit type organizations, places like the Nature Conservancy. Uh, helping them understand what properties are the most important to uh, preserve, uh, looking for uh, hot spots of biodiversity, uh, then managing properties that uh, Nature Conservancy and other uh, organizations own. There's a lot of uh, jobs available for uh, property managers that do some of this stuff, do this restoration stuff. They also do environmental education, lots of pretty fun things. Um, then there's also jobs doing uh, environmental consulting, where you're working with companies trying to help businesses um, uh, uh, do their business in an environmentally uh, sustainable, environmentally conscious way, working within the environmental uh, regulations and laws that are out there, which is also some pretty interesting uh, job opportunities. So lots of, uh, lots of fun things that you can do with environmental science. What, uh, what thoughts or questions do you have? We've got maybe two minutes here. Yeah. Where did, uh, where did you go to school? Where did you go to college? Yeah, I, I went to uh, uh, Wittenberg University for a year and then out to uh, Greenville College in Greenville, Illinois. I went to small schools. Um, and I really like the small school atmosphere. Marion's pretty small, too, a couple thousand students. I really like uh, that about it. Uh, our class sizes are tiny because of that, for the most part. You know, freshman class might be this size to 30 or maybe a few more than that on some occasions. But my upper division classes, my junior senior classes, are usually 10 or so, which makes it great for doing projects, actually getting some hands-on experience, and for me being able to, to really know my students and interact with my students. Then I went to uh, Washington State University for graduate school out in uh, Eastern Washington. I got a PhD out there. What are the questions here? 